Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Samantha Crawley from Cardinus, and I just wanted to extend a warm welcome to all you guys participating in this webinar for Understanding the Fire Safety Act 2021. So I'm the Technical Survey Manager at Cardinus, and I'm doing this in conjunction with Dorian Lawrence, who's our technical partner, and he's the Managing Director of FRC. So um, we're going to be presenting this to you. Um, Dorian will do an introduction, and he's going to look through all the various different acts of the Fire Safety Act. And he's going to guide us through everything that happens, the various laws, the changes, what we have to look at and various you know, arising issues that's come from the Fire Safety Act. And um, then I'm going to have a little bit after he's done all that and we can look at the practicalities and what it means to some of us in you know, the world of fire safety over and above you know, the high rise buildings and how we apply some of these issues and what we have to do practically in order to meet the compliance and the issues coming on with that. Um, so I'll have a quick chat with you after Dorian's completed his bit and then after that we're going to follow it up with a question and answer session. It would be lovely if you would have some questions if you put them into the question and answer as we go along. Uh, so pop in your, your questions, type them in and we'll try and get to answer all of them. We'll answer as many as we can within the hour that we've got today and if not we'll try and follow it up if we can't quite get around everything. So I'm going to hand over now to Dorian and um, Welcome, great to see you all, and I um, hope you enjoy it and you'll be able to take something away. Good afternoon, I'm Doreen Lawrence, the Managing Director of FR Consultants. And uh, for those of you that haven't used us or don't use us, we are a unique fire engineering and chartered building consultancy, offering a complete end-to-end -end solution with regards to the facade remedial and fire safety issues. From the initial EWS, the external wall survey, fire engineering, production of a robust tender pack, including conceptual design, through to placing the contract, overseeing the works by a qualified clerk of works for the sign off of the new facade and EWS one form, a comprehensive solution to the massive amount of problems that we've uh, got with buildings in the UK. So what we're going to look at uh, in my section is where we are, and how did we get into the mess that we're in? The Fire Safety Act and what that really means, the fundamentals of it. Funding, what's happening with regards to how these buildings are going to be funded. And the ongoing regulatory reform followed by the Building Safety Bill. But first of all, let's have a look at where we are and let's have a review of the guidance, legislation and regulations. And this slide sets out a really good timeline to give you an understanding understanding of how much documentation there is to interpret. So in 1984 we had the Building Act enforcing the requirements for works for the building regulations, so making building regulations a legal requirement. 2005 the fire safety order, some confusion over whether the external wall is included within the fire safety order, we'll come on to that shortly. Changes to building regs in 2006 and 2010. 2017 the uh, dreadful Grenfell tragedy, which highlighted how appalling our housing stock is. 2018, further major changes in building regulations, followed by uh, government advice note numbers 1 to 22. Now, advice notes cover retrospectively. Building regs only cover moving forward. So the government needed to come up with a way to try and mop up all of the issues on the uh, current stock. 2019, the ACM fund launched £600 million, a good contribution towards the issues with buildings clad in ACM, however, quite a difficult fund to deal with. 2019, the lending sector came up with a form, an EWS1 form, to ensure that they were lending on compliance stock. 2019, Building Safety Fund announced so we could then start to see how we were going to have to comply with new mandatory documentation. And 2019, 2020, the Fire Safety Bill. 2020, government decided to get rid of all of the old advice notes, 1 to 22, which were confusing, had quite a lot of overlap and had several issues and came up with um, really quite a good advice note, which is clear and concise, which applies to all buildings, uh, all residential buildings of all heights. 
2020, the fire safety bill first draft release, so we could really get some detail on it. 2020, registration opens for the £1 billion fund, and we'll talk about that a little later on. But in theory, really good, but uh, quite difficult to work with because it doesn't cover all of the elements of work. Further changes to building regs in 2020, followed by a further announcement on the three and a half billion pound fund and also a loan scheme, which again, we still haven't got details on. And we were told yesterday that that's two to three months away. New EWS1 guidance released this year in April, uh, which again has generated a fair amount of confusion because not all lenders have adopted it, only 70%. And we're seeing EWS1 inquiries at their highest level. Fire Safety Act 2021 passes in April and then 2023, we've now got a timeline for the building safety bill uh, to be announced and we know we'll know what we've got to work with. But all of this documentation and legislation and guidance leading to safe, compliant, mortgageable, saleable and insurable buildings. But there is a lot of documentation there to understand. And if you're a property manager or you have a role in health and safety, it's a very complicated and changing landscape when it comes to actually understanding what applies to what buildings at what time. I think it's important that we all understand how we've got here because our residential stock is of pretty poor quality. We've undertaken 2,800 reports on various different buildings and uh, over the last five years, and we can uh, get a really good snapshot of to what the major issues are. But our understanding is that cost-cutting measures by main contracts and developers have caused a lot of the issues. Just for example, and I use Grenfell a lot as an example, because that started off at a £13 million bid, and the contract was placed at £9 million. So there was £4 million of some form of value engineering during that process. And there was a million pound error on ride and construction estimate. So they'd taken the job on a million pounds under what they should have done. Poor quality workmanship and lack of qualified consultants, management and installers, again, driven by cost. And the contractual method that we use, the design and build contract, if it's used correctly, it works perfectly well. But with the contracts uh, involve a client working directly with a contractor, there is no intermediary uh, rather than an architect or a PQS having control and being able to check the works. And the contractor is fundamentally checking and signing off their own work. And with this type of contract, value engineering is incentivized because every pound that the contractor or developer saves is then going straight to the bottom line of that company. Checking of building works over the past 50 years has been minimal. The quality of install that we see in a lot of cases is very, very poor. And we've seen the demise of the role of the clerk of works. And we've reintroduced that role back into the construction industry. And there's an MVQ qualification all of our clerk of works have to check and ensure that the works are installed correctly. Complicated and confusing processes and regulations have allowed developers and contractors to try and reduce the specification of works to reduce costs using loopholes between advisory sections in the building regs and mandatory sections. And also the lack of understanding by main contractors and developers to engage the correct cost and uh, checking consultants. And I use Grenfell again as an example. During the conception stage, the fire engineer engaged on the project didn't even open the facade drawings of the building and check what was going on it. And then during the construction stage, Ryden Construction, the main contractor, and Harley Curtain Walling, the subcontractor installing the facade, didn't even engage a fire engineer to design a fire strategy for the building. So the Fire Safety Act, an introduction into it. So the Fire Safety Bill was introduced on the 19th of March 2020, and became law on the 29th of April this year, and it follows the government's fire safety consultation. It's a major change in the mandatory requirements for buildings containing two or more sets of domestic premises. And the Fire Safety Act is the first legislative step in the process of implementing the recommendations from the Grenfell Tower Inquiry Phase 1. 
And we know at Grenfell that all of the materials used on the facade, and it's concluded by Dr. Barbara Lane, that all of the individual materials all together as a facade did not meet building regs. And whilst it is a relatively short technical document, it makes some significant changes. The general purpose of the Fire Safety Act is to amend the scope of the Fire Safety Order, and it focuses in the spirit of the Fire Safety Order, that it is lives before property. And it gives relevant authority the power to amend the regulatory reform. So uh, uh, ability to be able to change the 2005 Fire Safety Order. And in England, that will be the Secretary of State. And in Wales, that will be the Welsh ministers. And the Act clarifies that where a building contains two or more sets of domestic premises, the things to which the order applies are the structure and external walls and any common parts. And there was confusion over the 2005 fire safety order as to whether they were included or not. But it also includes now doors and windows and attachments. So attachments not just being uh, balconies. Resolates, solar shading. Uh, we're also seeing green walls that have been bolted onto the side of a building which have highly combustible plastic within them. All doors between domestic premises and common parts are now covered and must be checked. So new guidance yet to be finalised under a public available specification 9980, PAS 9980, will set out how a fire risk appraisal and assessment should be set out of the external wall construction and cladding of existing blocks. And the new framework for assessing external walls, giving recommendations and guidance on undertaking the fire risk appraisal and assessment, the FRAA, of the external wall construction of a multi-storey, multi-occupied residential building. And the standard is intended for use by fire engineers and other building professionals to come up with a standard way of undertaking an FRA to make sure that everything is covered. There are strengths and weaknesses, and the RICS within their latest EWS1 course have issued some concerns with regards to the way that it will be set out. It comes out in September this year, so once it comes out, we'll be running a further training course on that. But it does have its limitations. It does not address insurer's requirements. It's a risk-based approach, and therefore, to a degree, subjective. It will not address the protection of firefighters, and it will not, um, it doesn't possess the rigour that's required to support litigation and can only be based on the knowledge available at the time of the inspection. So what will it cover? It will cover all multi-storey, multi-occupied buildings of uh, two or more dwellings and it applies to England and Wales. And it's likely that it will affect around 1.7 million residential properties. So a colossal amount of work. Have we got enough resource within the UK to uh, undertake the works properly and correctly in a timely manner? So a particular focus of the Act is to increase enforcement, uh, particularly where remediation of dangerous cladding is not taking place. And we see that our customers sit in two different silos, ones that are really addressing uh, the issue, are registered with the Building Safety Fund and pushing through, and others which seem to be ignoring the issue and burying their head in the sand a little bit. Breaches of the Fire Safety Act 2021 and regulatory reform um, will be now be a non-compliance with law and enforced by the fire and rescue authorities. And I think we will see an increase of the use of prohibition notices uh, as the fire service will really be pushing to ensure buildings are compliant. So let's look at funding. How is all of this external facade work going to be funded? And the first part to note is that Parliament refused to make amendments to the Fire Safety Bill, now the Fire Safety Act, that would financially protect leaseholders from the cost of remediation, allegedly due to the lack of its potential to delay the implementation of the bill. So lessees could still be sat there with the bill at the end of the day. 
Although a £5 billion pounds approximately has been committed to the issue by the government, the Housing Communities and Local Government Committee has estimated the true cost will be circa £15 billion. Now, that's just with regards to the external facade. What happens with regards internally? We know in recent fires, there's been internal compartmentation issues where smoke has spread from the eighth floor, even up as high as the 18th floor. So what's going to happen when we start to look internally? Um, I think that will be another uh, major issue that we're all going to have to start considering now. How are our buildings compartmented internally? And the building safety fund, so the one billion building uh, safety fund, which in theory is a, a colossal amount of money, but not enough to address the issues. And just to run you through the statistics on it, we have 2,785 applications in total. 466 have been withdrawn, 480 not eligible, and they do not meet the criteria. So probably under the height limit of 17.7, their materials might not be as combustible as they originally thought. However, the one, the scary fact for me is the 741 that are waiting to be, uh, to the government are waiting for answers from the managing agents or the freeholders as they've tried to make contact but cannot get any response. So there's potentially another 741 buildings uh, that could still need remediating. Buildings that have progressed through is 1,098. And 646, the government have reviewed and they've met technical eligibility. A casework has been assigned and the responsible person can claim 10% of the cost of the works as pre-tender support. It's taken nine months to get through 646. However, we've got 452 that are at appeal or haven't got a caseworker assigned and therefore cannot appoint a consultant because they probably don't have the funds. And in most cases, service charges just don't have the funding to be able to pay a consultant to start the design and putting the tender pack together. So if there's 452, that's six months. The uh, fund cutoff is the 30th of the six. Yes, next week, you've got to have all your prices in, all aligned by next week, or you have to write to try and get an extension of time. And who knows how difficult it's going to be to get an extension of time. But we're told that they will be granted as long as the works are happening at pace. So potentially, out of the 2,785, 1,098 blocks will end up being remediated from the building safety fund. But what happens to buildings where the works uh, there are works outside of the fund. So, for example, when you've got balconies or we have one building at the moment that has repairs to the concrete frame, um, how are those works going to be funded? Because we can't start work until we know that we've got the funds in place. So the managing agent is going to have to collect those funds, which could take, in some instances, several years, possibly up to five years, to collect those funds before the works can start. Where the works outside the fund are on the critical path. So the fire safety bill is part of the ongoing regulatory reform with more legislative changes coming in uh, the form of the building safety bill. And that's due to come in in 2023. But with regards to the consolidated advice note, it says that the bill should be enacted in spirit ahead of any legislative changes. So make sure that you're getting ready for the building safety bill and all of the issues that it brings. And the reform of the building safety system, the building safety bill coupled with the Fire Safety Act will generate massive changes. And with regards to the building safety bill, it will initially apply to existing and new buildings of 18 metres or six storeys, whichever comes first. Now, six storeys could be as low as 15.4 metres, but the building safety fund only starts at buildings over 17.7. So there's disparity between the two. It's confusing. It's unclear. But the, uh, those responsible for the safety of residents are accountable for any mistakes and must put them right to enforce new rules and take strong actions against those who break them. So there will be a new set of rules coming in. The regulator will have three main functions to oversee the safety and standard of all buildings, assure the safety of higher risk buildings, so those 18 metres or six storeys, and improve the competence of people responsible for managing and overseeing building work. We know construction has been of an appallingly low standard. More stringent set of rules will be in place, 
But once the building is registered with the building safety regulator, you will have to apply for a building assurance certificate. The accountable person will need to conduct and maintain a safety case for a risk assessment. And it's key that we understand what information you're going to have to gather with regards to producing that safety case. And I'm sure that as managing agents, you don't get very much information. And we certainly don't see very much when we request that uh, what documents have you got. But you need to start thinking about what information you will need. So as built drawings, floor plans, we hardly ever get drawings of the buildings, but we now scan every building that we have and produce those in CAD. Fire strategy, evacuation plans, product information, test data, but regulation 38 uh, information. And regulation 38 is the building regulation that says on completion of the works, the main contractor or developer must pass all information about fire safety over to the responsible person so that they can produce a correct fire strategy and fire risk assessment. So to collate all of that information is between 10 and 20,000 pounds. So another cost that's going to have to be borne by the lessees. But again, it's going to take some considerable time to gather all of that information and we're just launching a service to assist our customers uh, with collection drawing of the buildings and actually producing a file getting ready for that so this is how we think it will look you'll have a health and safety executive bearing in mind that building control has never set underneath the health and safety executive before which will uh, mean that there will be harder uh, and larger penalties uh, the National Building Safety Regulator will be set up with a team of enforcers and the three, com uh, three committees to the left. The accountable person duty holder uh, will be answering to the National Building Safety Regulator, but the accountable per person will appoint a building safety manager. And there will be a team of consultants underneath the um, building safety manager, assisting with all of that information and process, helping get the building assurance certificate. So we can see with all of the documentation, the circle of compliance is closing. We have the 1984 Building Act and the building regulations. We have the consolidated advice note. And whilst not mandatory, RICS have uh, confirmed that if you do not confirm, uh, conform to it, it could leave the responsible person exposed. We have the Fire Safety Act, we have the Building Safety Bill, and we now have the Building Safety Fund, the one billion. We have a further three and a half billion, which guidance will be announced shortly. And we're going to have a loan system for those buildings under 17.7. So my advice is that you need to get ahead as penalties under the acts will be fairly severe. And first and foremost, we need to make sure that our housing stock is safe and compliant. So I'm going to hand over to you, Samantha, and um, then we'll take Q&A at the end. Okay. Thank you, Dorian. That was a very informative um, set of, of uh, presentation. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to just run through a few things on how we can practically help in terms of fire risk assessment and what you might need to do. Dorian's mainly focused on obviously the more, uh, shall we say, high rise, high risk buildings. But let's not forget that there's between 11 and um, 18 metres, something like 77,000 odd buildings that all require some kind of risk profile, some perhaps some kind of remediation, perhaps not. Um, so we'll go through some questions that were asked often. I'll go through the, say, the top 10 questions that we've had recently, show you a couple of case studies on different types of buildings, discuss a few issues that our clients have had and um, wrap everything up. OK. So the fire safety proposals, as we've heard, are still under review and there will be new guidance from the Home Office available um, on various different subjects as we go forward. Some parts of the uh, guidance have been removed and are being reviewed in order to update them and we'll continue to monitor and update as the new guidance comes out. Um, the consultation is still going on in a number of areas and I know that ARMA members and RPM and their members have been heavily involved in consultation, various different things, peeps and all the rest of it. 
we're anticipating further um, regular, regular regulation and guidance on responsible persons and the building safety manager roles. What is it you have to do entirely? The um, personal emergency evacuation plans. There's been a lot of um, gray area around these and what is it? What do you need to do? How much do you need to provide for it? Um, I'll talk about that a little later. Premises information boxes. Do you need them in existing buildings and what should they have? And the fire flat door checks, how often should you do it? You know, three, three months, six months annually. We're still waiting for the um, regulations to come out on that. And what we need to dis discover in terms of flat front doors and what needs to be included in those. And the provision of fire safety instructions. So communicating with your occupants, with your residents, what levels of communication and what you have to tell them. Um, obviously, there'll be lots of other stuff coming up and further guidance will be forthcoming and will help with the interpretation of that as we go forward. Thanks, Dorian. So what do we do? Identify and tackle the fire risk. So obviously there are different types of buildings. So you might have um, a purpose-built building after 2005. It might be a purpose-built building, you know, going back a little further than that from the 1980s. It might be a converted building. It might be a converted Victorian residence. It might be a converted office building. They all have a different type of risk rating depending on the build quality and the type of building they are and the history of the building within that building. The enforcement now, it extends into 11 to 18 metre buildings, of which there are 77 and a half thousand in the UK. This is the next level that the Fire and Rescue Service will focus on. So far, the last three, four years, they've identified most of the high risk buildings, and now they're going to have the opportunity to extend into buildings that they think might have a risk of five, four, three storeys. So the risk rating of an individual building can be complex. Um, we can offer guidance and analysis. Uh, it may be that evacuation strategies of a stay put that have been in process for the last 20 years are no longer suitable. Um, we can look at those and give advice and guidance and allocate specific requirements according to the legislation that's coming out. Um, we can identify issues and allocate tasks on a risk improvement programme. This will be both for you know, the level of risk, is it high, medium or low, and how long you might have in order to put that into process. And we can assist with matters of fire safety being raised going forward. So it's not always the same kind of issues. We look along a holistic assessment of the building, looking at the compartmentalization. So the compartmentalization in a, in a new purpose-built building will be quite different to a purpose-built building that's 20 years or 40 years old. And the same also goes when you're looking at older buildings you know, perhaps Victorian 1930s that have been converted and how well that conversion has taken place. Thank you. So different levels of um, risk improvement. So we look at what level of risk the building is, quantify exactly what needs to be done with that building. We can signpost to whether you need a particular survey done. So would you need an external survey, a type four risk assessment? Would you like to do um, a full in-depth compartmentalization survey? So you would need to look at the internal structures, whether it was built according to the proper regulations, how well the compartmentalization was conducted, you know, whether it was done in accordance and whether certain bits have just been missed off and not finished. You often find that you get, you know, good compartmentalization in the bits that you can see, but the bits around the corners in the risers or in between apartments haven't been properly finished off. There's also a specific fire door survey, which is again considered to be one of the compartmentalized issues by the fire and rescue service. So fire doors in themselves, not only just the fire doors in common parts, but we would also include within that the fire doors in between the flats and the common areas. So these may be and were previously to 2020 advice note 23 considered the demise of the resident or the owner of the building. And these now come within the compartmentalization of the entire block and the protection of the escape routes. And the fire and rescue service will look to the managing agents or the responsible person of the building to ensure the integrity of those, regardless of whether they're demised within 
the common parts or not. So that is a very sticky wicket and a, a problem that many people are issuing with. So the other thing is what fire precautions are within a building, the alarm systems, early warning, whether you need an alarm system within a building. Generally speaking, a purpose-built block doesn't have a fire alarm. However, and I'll talk about fire alarms a little later, there are certain purpose groups or building issues that would require a fire alarm into them. These might be maintenance issues. So for example, you get a Victorian building that was converted 40 or 60 years ago. There's no way that those um, voids within that building would have been properly tackled. And you're gonna have you know, floating floors, you're gonna have timber floors, you're gonna have voids running up and down the building where you've got lath and plaster perhaps behind the overboarded uh, <coughs> chip rock plaster that's going to be a problem and it's not something that you can get over so in cases like that you need to put a higher level of perhaps warning system in and then there's also the testing and servicing of installations so it's not just having the fire alarm or the AOVs or the uh, emergency lighting it's how often and how regularly those systems are tested and the enforcement services will be looking at whether the testing is done and it's recorded as being done or whether there are any outstanding issues that are left over, you know, three months, a year. Sometimes, you know, it can take a year or two years to involve if you've got an expensive maintenance program to get going, in which case the responsible person would be looked at quite seriously and what action had they taken to ensure that maintenance was properly completed in a reasonable time frame. Okay, Doreen. So questions, these are some of the ones that we've been asked most regularly and they come up time and time again on different buildings. What risk rating is your building? Cladding, how to apply an evaluation in the medium to low rise and the medium to low risk buildings. Because we're seeing a lot of um, buildings here, which, you know, they're under the 18 meters, they're under 11 meters, but they've still got a significant amount of perhaps timber or HPL or other types of cladding on the outside of the buildings. How do you evaluate that? What evacuation strategy should it be? What might, you know, what might change it? What, what reasons would we have to change it from a stay put to a simultaneous? If you do have to change it, what interim measures are required? What level of measurements do you need? Um, door surveys and flat front doors. So what is necessary in a, in a flat front door survey? And how do we go about doing that? Management and communication. Well, there's all different types and levels of communication. Not only is it necessary to engage with the residents, with the fire and rescue service, uh, completing the golden thread information, keeping that type of property information, how long do you have to keep it for, where should it be? You know, in the length of a building, we're looking at, you know, not just this year or next year or three years time. These things need to go down 20 or 40 years throughout the building's, you know, life and history. And where does the record and the golden thread need to sit? What do you do about that? Moving on. Personal evacuation plans, how do you put that into effect? And then alarms, do you need one? And what specification of alarm do you need to have? Enforcement, what do the changes in the new Fire Safety Act look like? And what does enforcement, what happens when, that, when you get involved in that? And then more mitigation factors, what can we do about you know, making our buildings safer, even if we're not gonna change everything on the outside? Are there things that are going within the building that we could signpost towards the fire and rescue service to say, well, actually, there might be this risk, but can we do something to decrease the risk and make it the best we can in order that, you know, we can carry on, you know, without spending a huge amount of money? Or what do we need to do to make it most reasonably practical? Thanks, Dorian. So how do we apply a risk rating to a building? So in order to ascertain the priority, you need to say, what is the likelihood of fire, low, medium and high? So a low risk building would be a modern building that's got all the fire precautions in, the electrical installations are less than 20 years old, it's been well maintained, we're not seeing any damage or maintenance issues. You might find you've got a building that's 40 years old, say a 1980s purpose-built block of flats, to all intents and purposes, most of it looks perfectly fine to the, you know, the naked eye. But remember that all the electrical installations, not only within the common parts, but also those within all the apartments, might be 40 years old by now. How does the maintenance look on them? Does it look as if it's been well maintained? Has money been spent on the building in the interim? And it would increase going forward with the, the, the longer the age and the lack of maintenance. Then you have a high risk building. 
typically something that's you know perhaps got to the end of its life as a commercial building got a little bit run down the developers bought it done a redevelopment into you know residential flats it all looks nice and dandy but actually when you look behind the scenes and you see that some of the things perhaps they've modified an existing fire alarm that's 60 years old and it's not fit for purpose but nobody knows because it hasn't been you know hasn't been um maintained hasn't been investigated in the you know impending in the 20 years since it was changed into a residential building so things like that we would say would increase the risk of fire and then you have to look at what would the consequence be so if you've got a low-rise building that people can leave within two minutes it's slight harm if you've got a slightly bigger building and it's got long corridor spaces or you know lobbies to go through then it would increase to a moderate or extreme harm in the case of a building like that that hasn't been well maintained has perhaps got you know a certain amount of damage from residents or you know wear and tear over the period of time and you'd have to look at the individual building the build rates what it looks like and how it's been maintained over the years and then assign the risk according to that building thanks Dorian so here's a few examples so when I say low risk on the left hand side I've got a very nice modern block of flats it looks like it's a nice rendered thing but if you look carefully you can see around the windows and on the sides you've got a few balconies they've got timber cladding you've also got timber cladding on the windows outside the windows so whilst this will be low risk we would want to be highlighting that these things are you know within the demise of the building and it might be something within the next period of you know maintenance or relocation instead of you know painting those outside areas it might be something to look at planning to change the timber to perhaps a hardy plank which is a cementaceous similar looking type of product or perhaps something else entirely if we look at the second example medium risk medium height so we've got essentially four stories and an undercroft this building is entirely clad in uh, an american style cedar timber cladding um, which is flammable if you look on the side of it you've also got a range of um, timber balconies which could easily you know uh, have fire spread could you move on Dorian can I see the next slide Dorian okay so if we look at this picture here this is a, a real-time example on the 9th of September 2019 there was a fire in Worcester Park this is actually exactly the same building as I've showed you in the previous slide and it's on the same estate whether it's the same or a very similar one this is the American clad cedar type building so at 1 30 a.m a fire broke out on one of the balconies and the fire raged for five hours 20 fire crews attended the fire spread very quickly externally amongst the whole of the building the building was enveloped in fire and flames and the whole block was um you know it was it was it was lost the residents lost everything the fire was identified as starting on a balcony and spread very quickly to the entire envelope of the building there's no reason to suspect that this wasn't a well-managed block but however it was a high-risk building because of the level of flammable materials and this is on a four-story building so this is why we're seeing examples like this and we are noting that within you know a reasonable amount of time these types of risks will be identified and perhaps something will need to be done to remediate. So here's a couple more examples. This is a typical high rise, high risk building on the left hand side. So we've got a very tall building. We've got a nice brick facade on the first five stories, but above and beyond that, we've got ACM cladding and other types of cladding. So this building requires an immediate change to a simultaneous evacuation and the installation of a waking watch. In a building that's high risk like this, even if you install a full fire alarm system, it would still require a waking watch until remediation you know, comes to fruition. So fairly expensive for the residents, a very difficult project and one that's not going to be done within the next 12 months. If we look at the next one, this is another building. Again, it's high rise over 10 storeys. Um, this is mainly it's a solid, con it's solid concrete framed building. It was converted from an old hospital building and you've got mainly brick on the exterior but there are large areas where you've got the windows with a lot of spandrel cladding on them and the top two stories have got uh, cladding that needs remediation but again this building was seen as being 
medium risk, not high risk. So on the installation of an L2 alarm system, as they've got a concierge system 24 hours, who could instigate any alarm, investigate if there's a false alarm and alert the fire and rescue service. There's no requirement for a waking watch within this building and it can stay like that until remediation continues. Thank you, Dorian. So stay put. Stay put is recommended as the de default safest strategy. So that would mean that the buildings, safety services, compartmentalization and all the rest of it would be able to support the stay put. You don't need an alarm system within that type of um, building. There may be smoke alarms, smoke detectors in order to look at uh, <coughs> operate the automatic opening vents. In any event, in the stay put pod stay put property, you would need to have ventilated escape routes and you may have some um, small, you know, automatic vents opening in it. If you can't support a stay put, the National Fire Chiefs Council recommend that changes only on a temporary basis for 12 months to a simultaneous evacuation. Now, as we've seen with the amount of people available to put all these things in process, the difficulty in raising funds and, you know, the complex technical difficulties in remediating difficult problems that, you know, it's very unlikely that some of these buildings are going to be remediated within 12 months. Therefore, you would need to have some kind of process and a record of the steps that you've taken in order to revert to a stay put policy. So it may be that you've got a simultaneous evacuation in any case and you can't support a stay put. So certainly some older buildings um, are typically a Victorian building. You know, you've had a Victorian villa and it's been converted into three or four flats or, or more. So the likelihood is that you won't be able to establish the proper compartmentation within that building. And certainly it's the case if you've got grade two listed buildings that stay put is not required. And so they may just be reverting to a simultaneous evacuation staying that way. External cladding changes it and temporary alarm specifications would be required if you've got a simultaneous on a temporary basis. And it may be the building is sufficiently seen as a high risk that pending installation of the fire alarm, you may need a waking watch. So the implementation of the waking watch and the change in evacuation strategies, there's all kinds of regulations that would need to be done um, implementing situations. So interim measures, a risk-based guidance would recommend what measures would be needed depending on the level of risk of your building. What you would need to do, what would the temporary alarm specification be and how you would put the waking watch in, what you need in order to have a waking watch, how you would manage that waking watch, fire drills, um, you know, how you would need to record, how often they would need to walk the perimeter and the interior of the building and how would you test that they're doing the job properly. You know, many people say, oh, let's put a waking watch in and they think, oh, I've got three people on the ground, everything's fine. Well, it depends on how many apartments they're looking after, how long it takes to actually do the patrols and, you know, what breaks they have and what facilities you put in place for them and how you record that information and test that those things are being done. Of interest, Birmingham um, Fire and Rescue Service um, in the middle of the night hop in one of their fire tenders and they have done exercises where they go around all the buildings with a waking watch in and they found several of them fast asleep. So <laughs> that's not great, is it? But you know, that's how it goes. So door surveys. So we're now bringing the door and the flat front doors under enforcement as part of Article 17 of the Regulatory Reform Order. Further guidance, as we've said, is expected. So there will be specifications for how often it needs to be done, how many of the doors you need to check. But a risk improvement programme can identify what level of survey is required. So for example, if you've got a fairly small block of flats, say 20 flats, it might be something that you can do on instigation of, um, you get, could be part of your fire risk assessment. If it's a larger block of flats or there are greater problems within it, it might be that an individual fire door assessment is required and you have a fire door survey. There are many, many different sorts of things that you have to look at. So it might be um, the fire doors themselves, whether they're suitable and sufficient, whether they've got any maintenance issues, whether the hinges have started to creep. Certainly in older buildings, as they settle in, we can find that the door sets no longer fit within four millimeters of the doors and frames and whether there's any damage. So you might have that a fire door has been um, broken into, the locks have been damaged. 
you might have that somebody's cut a cat flap in the door or you might find that somebody's been along with the resident and said oh I don't like the um the look of this one so I'm going to put on something that's you know a Georgian pattern door but they haven't gone out and got one for the right specification all these things need to be taken into account so the door furniture and we have to look at whether the self closers are still there whether they were there in the first place whether people have removed them because often you know residents think oh i don't want my door closing i'll just take that off it's annoying so those things need to be taken into account and how old are the doors and what kind of maintenance has gone on are they in good condition you might have doors that are 20 40 years old in very good condition because they've not served any damage but again we can find incidences where you've got blocks of flats where the you know, residents haven't looked after them so well and the maintenance issues have come. Um, so all these things are taken into account on a door survey. There's at least five different sections of checking for a fire door. Moving on to communication. So building a safer future, we've discussed already the need for the golden thread of safety information which will be maintained throughout the large life of a large residential building. Those who have already in process will need to start putting this together and start gathering the information as we've talked previously and those that are coming into you know you know finishing their building regulations they will have that that information and that needs to go somewhere safe this golden thread has to be something that is recorded and passed on often building managers change they move they leave the job or somebody else takes over what happens is often in the past is this information has got lost. We found instances where the O&M manuals have been you know, discarded when they move from one freeholder to another. So it will be a requirement that this information is held digitally and in a common place where it can be sent from one place to another if the management or freeholders or anything changes about that building. Thanks, Dorian. The other parts of communication that are very important to come together with now is the responsible person has a duty of management to record all communication with the stakeholders. Now this might be residents, so if you've got a building strategy or how to maintain the building in a safe fashion, there should be a fire policy which should be communicated to all residents. There are very different types of residents these days, so how do you communicate with them? One level of communication is generally not thought to be enough. So we would recommend three or four different forms of communication at any one time, particularly if you're changing the fire strategy and it needs to be recorded that that information has been sent out and it's been received. So you would have maybe letters put under each door. You would have perhaps an email to all of the people on your register. You might have a system where you've got um, an online thing. It might be sent, particularly if you've got student blocks, for instance, they might prefer to be sent a text about it. However it is, they need to be uh, communicated with. The fire and rescue service. So, peeps. Now this, oh, <laughs> you come back to that. So freeholders, again, they'd need to know all the information and also insurers would be interested to know what is going on. So peeps, the personal evacuation strategies. Now there is a um, fire safety document for disabled people. This doesn't necessarily reply apply to general needs purpose blocks. We are expecting some further information to come and some further guidance later on in the year. And of course, what we will do is we will apply what we know at the moment and look at you know what we might need to do. So it might be such thing as um, a practical about for a resident. Now it's not only whether the person is generally disabled, but it might be on a short term basis. For instance, somebody that breaks their leg or a, um, a pregnant lady in the third trimester before they deliver. So all of these things need to be taken into consideration and a personal evacuation plan put together. This is something that is, it can be quite, it can be quite challenging to find out what you need, what the person needs, how many people you've got within your building and to write an individual evacuation policy for the person that, that needs it. Okay. So alarms, there is no set specification, but the fire safety order requires it must be suitable and sufficient. There are several categories of alarms. So uh, generally we have category L for life safety, category M, which is a manual policy, and category P, which is to protect property, generally not used in residential blocks. 
So they're all set out under the BS 5839 and the risk assessment and the alarm specification and the fire strategy will determine what alarm system you need to have within a building. Generally, we don't recommend to have an alarm within a stay put building unless the residents are of a certain purpose group. So, for example, um, student accommodation is a big thing at the moment. You know, there's an awful lot of residential student accommodation being built and used in almost all of our major cities and in the big universities. And they're often designed and let as long leaseholds. So, you know, the students will come in their second year and they'll just rent a flat for you know, the year. And if you have a high incidence of student accommodation, then perhaps it might be suitable to have an alarm system in there. There's also the incidence now of Airbnb, as we are finding a lot of home workers in the last 12 months. So certain cities where they had a lot of big blocks that were 100% um, occupied. So we've seen the incidence of management companies, particularly where key workers are you know, involved. So they'll take on and they'll let them manage on a temporary basis on an Airbnb, perhaps to key workers visiting a city because you know there's no um, hotels available in the last 12 months. The Fire and Rescue Service would require, if there's a large incidence of Airbnb, that within a block that the strategy is changed to that of an HMO or a hotel specification, and that would also require some kind of early warning and alarm system. And also the purpose group of senior living. So even though we're getting a lot of senior living of independent means, and they're all individual apartments, those types of residents are likely to have a higher incidence of requiring evacuation assistance. And therefore those types of blocks might also require some kind of alarm system within them. Um, it can be confusing in older buildings as well. Um, some of them have got systems put in because perhaps they didn't meet the requirements I've talked before of Victorian buildings and ones where you can't you know, guarantee that the compartmentalization and there aren't voids within the buildings, in which case then you know, they might require an alarm. And then also you might have alarms in particular areas, perhaps in underground parking, but not necessarily for the residential units. So you'd have a mixed evacuation strategy in the areas where people aren't residential, but they might be occupying a building. So enforcement, what does that look like? If you can't prove compliance, what does it look like? Here we have um, an example. So we've got, it now applies to all buildings regardless of height. Example 17 here is the removals of self-closers to flat front doors. Um, there's also, it requires a category two alarm. Um, I would probably recommend an LD2 according to BS 5839 and uh, should also have some heat detectors within within the rooms opening onto the escape routes and also grade D smoke alarms inside the apartments so that it's not connected but were it to go off within an apartment it would it would um, protect anyone sleeping within those places. So there are three levels of enforcement that you might receive. You might get a notice of deficiency or a letter um, which you know, sets out what is required and they would, the fire service would expect that to be dealt with and it might be something that um, you could deal with reasonably quickly and send them a letter. They may or may not come back and see it. If those articles are not dealt with, you may then get an enforcement notice and this might be for something that is gradually operating. Perhaps they might find that, you know, the AOVs haven't been maintained from one year to the next and then they would issue an enforcement notice and that will be time bound. So you will probably get 30 days or 90 days in order to fix whatever it was the issue that was under discussion. If these things aren't done or if the fire and rescue service come and do an audit on a building and they find it is you know, not compliant at all, then a prohibition notice may be issued and that is an immediate evacuation of the building. There are cases where the fire and rescue service have sent you know, a fire tender around, sat outside the building until all the residents are immediately asked to leave and move into alternative accommodation until such time as the dangerous issues have been completed. Prior to this year and the year before, I've seen very few, if any, prohibition notices, but quite a few are being issued and there is a higher incidence. So if you have one of these properties, what can we say that could mitigate that? So we're seeing uh, a change in May 2020 and it sets out the requirement for all new buildings over 11 metres to have sprinklers. This has come down from 
30 metres prior to that point. I don't see that there is any uh, requirement that buildings retrospectively be fitted with sprinklers. However, it might be something that developers or you know, people refurbishing buildings might consider putting in as a mitigation. And there's no need for those. They would be in flats mainly, no need for those to be in common parts. Um, generally common parts these days need to be free of any kind of combustible materials in any case. The other thing that we are seeing a requirement for is wayfarer signing, way, excuse me, wayfinding signage, signage for the fire and rescue service. So, on a large property, the fire and rescue services would want to see certainly where they've got more than one block of flats. If you've got which staircase it is and which floor that you're on, so on each floor of a of a escape stairwell, they want to see that. Case studies. Uh, here's an example. On the 7th of May 2021, a fire broke out in an eighth floor residence internal consumer unit. Um, the resident tried to put the fire out, something fell out of the cupboards. Um, the fire flat front door remained open, so the smoke was able to go into the corridor and the AOVs failed to fire off and didn't work. So what happened is that the entire eighth floor corridor filled up with smoke and other people were unable to exit because of toxic smoke and 35 people had to be rescued by the fire and rescue service. Overall, two people were taken to hospital and as a result of the fire. 171 persons were moved into alternative accommodation, so that will be very, very expensive for insurers. Investigations and witness statements from all interested parties will have to be done. And there's a planned case conference in 2021 to examine if any offences have been committed under the regular reform order. So they'll be looking at things like were the um, AOVs well maintained? What were the service records? Were there any recommendations from the service engineers in terms of that? It was generally a well managed block. Um, it was awaiting external fascia removal and the fire spread through timber balconies over three storeys externally. Now, looking at these balconies and looking at this building, you know, we often have the question about timber balconies and oh, it's only a small amount of it. But you can see within a fairly small area that timber is extremely combustible and can lead to fire spread. The other thing worth mentioning about this building is the smoke spread right through up, right through up to the top of the building internally into apartments on the 18th floor. So there will certainly be compartmentalization issues within this building. The responsible person will have to prove the maintenance was up to date and there were no outstanding issues that were awaiting action and the risk assessor will have to support investigations, there'll be witness statements from all interested parties and this will be a very long process in terms of investigation, interviews under caution and evidence of maintenance being provided by the property managers. Thank you Doreen. So in summary, Fire risk assessment will be a holistic view of all of the building, including external structure, internal structures, compartmentalization, fire doors, both for common parts and the flats, what the alarm and warning system is, what fire precautions are in there to mitigate any you know, incident that might happen. Routine testing and maintenance has been conducted and recorded. Remedial works required, how long that has been to complete or if there are things that are outstanding over a long extended period of time, what the evacuation strategy is and the emergency ac ac action plans, are the routes and exits in good order and easily accessible, and what kind of communication with residents and staff has gone on, does everybody know what's going on, is there a good level of interaction between the property management and the people working there. Um, we would look at all of these things and our Indigo system, we will put the risk improvement programs and in many cases, this would give you the evidence were something you know, to be looked at on the times and the actions that were taken to complete the works. So we conduct fire risk assessments, reinstatement cost assessments and all sorts of other things. Uh, anything to do with risk based surveys, including insurance. We are holders of the ISO awards 901. 1401, 4501, 2701, and we won the IIRSM Risk Excellence Award in 2021. And we're certified for life safety risk assessments. We've got a number of different um, 
qualified fire risk assessors and lots of people on our team have got lots of specialisms so we can we can take the right person to meet the right job we do all sorts of things in all different kinds of residential markets and we're members of armor and the armor and sit on the armor building safety group thank you thanks samantha um just just a final snapshot from me so uh we're a charter building consultancy and we deal with the complete end-to-end -end solution so with regards to all of the different issues whether it's the quantity surveying element the building surveying element the fire engineering element uh the structural and the design so with our staff all correctly qualified with uh, either fellows or members of the correct associations and we're just expect currently expanding our design and have taken on several RIBA staff um, so we provide that complete end-to-end -end solution which seems to be um, very popular but uh, one element worth um, thinking of is our CPDs that we run and our training sessions and we also offer a retained uh, consultancy and expert witness advice so um, if there's any further requirements, just um, drop us an email on our inquiries and we'll come back to you. Um, so let's, uh, I think we've got a couple of minutes, so let's, let's do a couple from the, from the Q&A. And um, there seems to be a little bit of an issue with that. More 62 chat, let's see. Uh, is an uh, EWS one a legal requirement now, or is it only required by lenders? Um, that is, uh, it's not a legal requirement, and the EWS one form is um, for for lenders only. It's not a health and safety document. It's not a uh, a life safety document. It is purely just for. Um, health and safety, uh, purely just for lenders. It doesn't have any health and safety implications uh, whatsoever. Uh, will the leaseholders or the service charge be responsible for paying for fire door works when they are de demised in their leases? Um, I, I think, uh, yes, I think the leaseholders, uh, especially under the Fire Safety Act, um, will be responsible for that. I think service charge is also going to change under the building safety bill. Um, there's going to be two service charges. There's going to be one for your normal items, insurance, lift maintenance, uh, cleaning, decoration, etc. And then there'll be one for any fireworks or structural works. Um, and the way that can be billed to lessees will be, um, will be different. Um, it can be billed once a quarter, so there'll be no excuses that you can't do it because you know you're going to be able to claim that money um, at the end of a quarter. Um, let me just see what else I can find out. Who is responsible to enforce fire regulations for flat fire doors? Uh, is the door is the doors are if the doors are demised to the leaseholders and are not part of the communal hallway. Um, Samantha, I'll, I'll pass that one over to you. You probably uh, a little bit more to speed than me on that. So that, that who, would, who would enforce it? The Fire and Rescue Service and the local authority would be the enforcing um, agents. And then you would get um, one of the three levels of enforcement. You get a letter or you get an enforcement notice or a prohibition notice. The person responsible, uh, depending on your lease, would be either the responsible person, including the managing agents, who would then need to talk or send out some kind of uh, communication to the leaseholders if they are demise the flat front doors. Right, okay. Um, one from James Bate, I think that's over to you, Samantha, with, uh, hi, we have many residents who are wheelchair users and live on top floor flats. Where does the responsibility fall when the property operates a full evacuation? What must be in place to accommodate or is it owner's responsibility? So typically where you've got disabled persons with mobility issues, they would need to have a personal evacuation policy written. Generally speaking, where, you know, we've seen these before, the Fire and Rescue Service do not recommend that, you know, the waking watch or the people who are responsible for managing the building, so perhaps a concierge or a property manager, are the people that have to effect this evacuation. Generally speaking, what they would say is that the individual person 
has to have, uh, for instance, an evacuation chair, and they would need to have personal assistance or someone that they could um, you know, call upon that would help them evacuate. If not, you would need a refuge area and a refuge area and be able to communicate with the fire and rescue service that a person was awaiting rescue in a safe place. Okay, thank you. Uh, how will the NHBC be involved with the building safety bill? Well, I would imagine they'd be fairly worried um, because it's going to trigger quite a lot of claims on their warranties. So remember that a, a warranty claim is only payable if they've overseen the building regulation work, but also with regards to um, the NHBC, it has to be a non-compliance with building regs at the time of construction. Um, the building safety bill will many many buildings will get checked in more detail for example if we think about all of that information that you've got to collate that we looked at so when we look at the reg 38 how has the building been um, compartmented internally that's going to be a key item to check and that would therefore trigger a claim um, uh, on the warranty if it hasn't been undertaken properly. And we see it a lot of times once you start removing sections of ceiling or party walls internally that there are lots of compartmentation issues. Um, so I would have thought from the building safety bill point of view, the NHBC will be getting quite a few more claims. We work quite closely with them um, on various claims um, uh, with regards to the external wall and internal compartmentation. Um, uh, we are seeking a surveyor support for an existing cladding building, four floors, high duplex apartments. Surveyors approach state that they are to undertake a six months course in order to manage the cladding issued. What is the advice regarding surveyors and capability to properly advise on cladding matters? Well, um, obviously properly qualified, uh, but I would suggest that it's in all the advice documentation, whether it's the RICS uh, EWS1 course, which all of our surveyors have undertaken um, it's essential that they have the right experience and again when you're looking at fire engineers you must check that experience because um, there's one thing dealing with facade um, and the through wall construction and I have 35 uh, years experience in that and properly qualified as a building surveyor and building engineer um, but then you've got to apply that to tall buildings which again is another form of construction so make sure that your surveyors are correctly qualified if you need further advice on that just drop us a line perhaps we can help you with it. Um, Samantha, read the inspection of flat doors. Most least demise the flat doors. Yeah, I think we've had that one. How can managing agents and RMCs be expected to oversee or control this as it is outside their leasehold remit? Well, that is that the, is. I think the Fire Safety Act. The Fire Safety Act has now brought that under. You know, that's now brought that under the. Um, you know, the, the it's brought that under the jurisdiction. I think that's a, it's a very difficult point and certainly where you've got leases where the flat front doors are demised elsewhere, it's a very sticky thing to have to put into process. Um, generally with these things, it comes under the general maintenance of the building and um, you, know, you would need to put pressure upon individuals if there's a breach in a particular door. Um, if it's something that's general and you need maintenance on all of it, then that would come under a service charge and a, a process that might be divvied up with everybody. Uh, and it depends upon your individual leases and the individual problems you have within the building as to how you might tackle one door, 20 doors, or you know the whole thing needs to be done. Thank you. Um, we've been trying to communicate with the MHCLG and the Building Safety Fund via their email context, but despite several chaser emails, we do not get any reply. Now, I assume that's because, uh, that's from Tim Williams, I assume that's because you haven't been assigned a caseworker yet. So what that does mean, if that is the case, Tim, and again, drops an email on inquiries, um, if that is the case, um, it's because you're sat in the 450-odd jobs that haven't got, um, that haven't got a casework yet which will happen eventually um if you if you want to drop me a quick mail um i have a meeting once a fortnight with the lead caseworker um and if it's a homes england job outside of london um we can sort of see what's happening with it but um yeah it's uh, it's quite a frustrating process not hearing and we fully understand that you'll probably get in pressure from your lessees or perhaps your freeholder as well um and it's really is um it's not very well managed in my opinion and it needs more 
Um, it needs more uh, communication and perhaps a timeline. And at our last panel meeting with Arma, I did ask for a communication to go out to all um, uh, managing agents and freeholders to say, this is the timeline. You will hear, but it might be in six months. If you haven't heard in the next month or so, don't worry. It will, uh, you will get, uh, you will get, we will get to you eventually. Um, just a general query. Yes, everyone will get a copy of the slides and a copy of the um, videos. So, uh, Yes, I think that sort of brings us up up to time. Really, we're a little bit over, so I do apologise for that. But, no, I just, um, if I you've just got any questions word. regarding Dorian, yeah, just sure. a quick word. Um, there's a lot of concern about low and medium rise buildings with limited amount of combustible materials, such as timber. Uh, at the moment, the golden thread and the advice is that information needs to be collected about property portfolios. So at the moment, all that's required is that the uh, property managers identify whether it's low or high risk or medium risk, and then think about a plan, you know, perhaps with a plan property maintenance. For example, timber as a building materials probably got a life expectancy of 20 years. So if you've got a 20 year old building with cladding on it of timber variety, it might be that you're thinking about your maintenance program and removing it and replacing it with a different kind of material. But putting a plan into process and making that part of your service charge and getting, you know, quotes and things on an on, on running, you know, over the years basis. I don't think any of this is going to come to enforcement before the, um, the 20. 23 building so at the moment there's nothing that actually enforces you to do something right at the moment unless it's a high risk building however it is important that you identify these buildings and put them into some kind of category and make a building plan a maintenance plan moving forward with them Thank okay you. thanks so we, we'll come back to any questions that we haven't answered um stephen's going to take all of those off of the uh, q a and off of the chat so we can uh, email you back on those and we'll be sending out the uh, video and the slides um shortly to you all so um, anything else samantha you'd like to cover um with regards to the EWS, a lot of people have said, you know, should we have an EWS certificate? It's not required in low rise buildings and it's not required unless um, a, a fund manager. So somebody from a building society or a bank is lending money against the property, then they might send a valuer surveyor out. And unless they raise the issue that they want one, there's no there's no requirement to have one. Yeah, it's not a it's not a legally binding document. Um, the the new EWS one guidance though does put a massive amount of onus on the valuer that's going there to um, sit, say if it needs a survey or not. And if the uh, if the valuer says they need one, um, it it would be required. So I think you'll find that the EWS ones will be requested pretty much on everything because I don't think the valuer will take the risk they receive between two hundred and fifty four to four hundred pounds the valuer property um, will they take the risk on their pi to say it doesn't need one and the rics guidance is very very clear that it is their responsibility so uh, i think uh, uh, yeah i mean trying to get ahead of uh, on especially on large blocks um, it may well but would be worth getting one but it's not a legal requirement so okay thank you um i think that's it we'll cover the rest of those questions via email but thanks to everyone for attending that's been uh, excellent and uh, look forward to seeing you all again and soon. thank you for all your lovely comments we're seeing some lovely comments coming up of people saying thank you and they've enjoyed it and it's been informative so thank you for that excellent thanks a lot thanks. okay bye bye